Buddha was quite clear about the fact that there are a lot of things in his awakening that he never told anybody else. But when he did talk about his awakening, it's interesting to note that he always focused on one theme, which is the Four Noble Truths. Sometimes he talk about the expansion of the Four Noble Truths into dependent core rising. But he never mentioned the three characteristics. He didn't awaken to the three characteristics, he awakened to the Four Noble Truths. And from the Four Noble Truths then he was able to awaken to Nibbana. And what are the Four Noble Truths about? They're about karma. They're about action. The actions you do to lead to suffering, and the actions you can do to lead to the end of suffering. You have a choice. And the fact that you have a choice is very important. The Buddha was not the kind of person who would go looking for fights, but he found that there were people who would teach that there was no choice in the present moment, that the present moment was totally determined by your past karma or by a Creator God. It was totally random. He would go and argue with those teachers. He took it that seriously. He told them that if that's what you're teaching, then there's no way to stop being a, a killer of animals, a stealer of things, a committer of illicit sex, a liar, a drunkard, because it would be all determined by what had happened before or be determined by things who are out of your control. Another time there were some Jains who claimed that when they did their austerities they were burning away their past karma. The proof of it, of course, was the pain they were feeling. So I went to argue with them, too. He said, how do you know this is past karma that's causing the pain? Have you ever noticed that when you don't do your austerities there is no pain? It's pointing to the fact that we make choices in the present moment. We have that power. Without that power, he said, it could make no sense of the path of practice. As for the question of who's making the choices, he said, put that aside. Focus on the choices. Focus on making them skillful. When he spoke in terms of mundane right view, he would talk in terms of beings doing actions and reaping the results in their actions. That's the kind of view that will continue leading you back to more more samsara. If you want to get out, you stop thinking in terms of beings. You look in terms of actions. After all, that was the insight and the second knowledge of his night of his awakening, that beings are reborn in line with their actions. That's why there's so many different beings that you can be. But he wasn't interested in who was doing the actions, he was just interested in what are the actions and what are the results? Look at, directly at the actions on their own terms. Which is why when he's speaking in terms of the Four Noble Truths, there's no mention of beings. There's just suffering, the cause of suffering, actions that lead to the end of suffering. Their duties, the duty with regard to suffering is to comprehend it. The duty with regard to its cause is to abandon it. The duty with regard to the cessation of suffering is to realize it, and you do that by developing the path. But again, he was able to express this all without reference to there being a being or not being a being. But as you're along the way, there are times when you need to make use of a sense of yourself, that you are competent to do this. And you will really receive the results of these actions that you're doing. And you can observe what you're doing and improve what you're doing. All of that involves a very basic sense of self. Now there will come a point where that self can take you all the way through the levels of concentration get you started on discernment, and you come to a point where you realize that one of the actions that you're doing that's causing stress and suffering is clinging to an idea of self. You create a sense of self. The Buddha calls it a hangama, mamangara, 
I making and my making. You lay claim to things as you or yours. And it's an activity. And as with all activities, the question is, when is it skillful, when is it not? And you learn how to create a skillful sense of self that can help you along the path. The sense that you will benefit from this. The sense that you're capable of doing this. Those are skillful selves. And you have to create them. And if you're not used to creating a competent sense of self, well, you have to learn how to do that, because otherwise you just get overwhelmed by the difficulties of the path. And if thinking in terms of self gets in the way, we focus back on actions again. Just keep doing what seems to be the most skillful thing. You commit to being as skillful as you can, and then you reflect on what you're doing. The commitment is important. You're not just looking at actions willy-nilly, whatever happens to come through the mind or happens to come out in terms of your words or your deeds. If you really want to learn, you try your best to do something skillful. And then if it doesn't come out skillful, okay, then you can learn from it. What needs to be changed? What needs to be improved? And focusing on the actions in that way, you're staying in line with the terms of the Four Noble Truths. It was when the Buddha taught the Four Noble Truths to the five brethren that they gained the Dharma eye. Now, some people say that when you gain the Dharma eye, you see there's no self. But that's misinterpreting a, an experience of cessation. There's a cessation, not, not quite the right word, state of. No perception. Or you just kind of blank out. And you can come out of that with all kinds of assumptions. You saw that there was no self in there, or there was nothing. But that's not the deathless, it's just a sideshow. What you really see and come to understand with the arising of the Dharma. I, it's expressed as whatever is subject to origination is all subject to cessation. The important word there is origination. The Buddha uses that to describe causation, and largely causes coming out of the mind. You begin to see the extent to which you are shaping your experience. The bodily fabrication, verbal fabrication, mental fabrication, before you were doing it in ignorance. When you adopt right view, you start making an assumption that this is an important aspect of your awareness to know. But with stream you see that it really is. You see how much the fact that you're experiencing the six senses really does depend on your intentions. When you drop your intentions, okay, then you're open to something that's in a different dimension. You come back from that, and it cuts through some fetters to the mind, some of the fetters that tie you. The process of sorrow. One of those fetters is self-identity views. In other words, viewing that you either are your aggregates or you own the aggregates, or the aggregates are in you or you're in the aggregates. But the mind doesn't think in those terms anymore, because it had that experience that had nothing to do with any aggregates at all, nothing to do with any activities. But there was a consciousness, the Buddha calls the consciousness of that surface. And so your sense of, I am this, or I own this, that gets shaken up. There still is a lingering sense of, I am. That's why the Buddha, when he was giving his first two sermons, saved the issue of not-self to the second sermon. This was something he delivered to people who had already gained stream entry. Now, if they had seen that there was no self in the course of stream entry, he wouldn't have had to give that second sermon. It's simply the fact that they still had that 
lingering sense of I am kind of floating around in an ill-defined way around the aggregates. That was what he had to loosen up. When they could drop that, because then they were fully awakened. But the context of all this, of course, is the Four Noble Truths. The idea of letting go of your sense of self as an unskillful activity makes sense only when you realize, or you've seen, that it's passion for your, your clingings that's causing suffering. And true happiness can be found by letting go of those clingings. And one of those clingings, of course, is your, your sense of self. That's when this sense of self, which has been so useful up to then, finally shows its shortcomings. So make use of a skillful sense of self as you follow the path. I've heard some people say that the self is a pitiful thing that's incapable of doing anything really skillful. Well, that's because they haven't trained their sense of self to be skillful. It can be trained. You take it as far as you can go. And then when it can take you no further, that's when you let it go. Don't throw it away beforehand. John Lee says people throw away their sense of self before they're ready. They let go like a pauper. They haven't developed the qualities inside that would lead to the deathless. They just say, well, I'm, these things are not self, so I should let them go. And they don't develop their aggregates. After all, the path is composed of aggregates. You see this most clearly in right concentration. You've got the form of the body, you've got the feeling of pleasure that comes from focusing on the breath. You've got the perception of the breath that helps you hold it in mind. It helps you use the perception of the breath as a whole body process that allows the sense of ease and well-being to spread through the body. That's a useful perception. Directed thought and evaluation are your fabrications. The intentions that hold you in the higher levels of jhana are also fabrications. And there's consciousness of these things. So there you are, the, the five aggregates in the path. So you don't want to throw away your aggregates too quickly. You don't want to throw away your sense of self too quickly. These things have their uses. Without them, you couldn't get anywhere. But it's when you take the Four Noble Truths as your basic framework for understanding what's going on. And as for the three characteristics of the three perceptions, you learn to see where do these things fit in. And part of the duties with regard to the cause of suffering is you want to abandon it. You abandon passion for the cause. You abandon passion for the clinging. And one way to get past passion for these things is to see their drawbacks. And that's when the Buddha would have you pull out those three perceptions. But the Four Noble Truths come first, I mean, just in the line of the first two sermons. The first sermon was about the Four Noble Truths. The second one is about the three characteristics, or the three perceptions. The first forms the framework. And as Sariputta later said, it's the Four Noble Truths that form the framework for all skillful dharmas. The same way that the footprint of an elephant can contain the footprints of all the other animals that walk on earth. The Four Noble Truths contain all skillful dharmas. So if you understand skillful dharmas and what their role is in the path, always refer things back to the Four Noble Truths and their duties. We have to get things in the right context. Then you can really understand them, how they relate to the truths that the Buddha awakened to. There's so many issues that he chose not to address because they don't fit in with the Four Noble Truths. So many things he chose not to talk about because they don't fit in with the Four Noble Truths. So if you find yourself wandering off in questions that the Buddha would put aside, you've basically left the Four Noble Truths. You've left that framework, and you're free to leave it. 
Nobody's forcing you to go back. But if you want to see things in a way that leads to awakening, you get back inside the Four Noble Truths and let them be your guide. <laughs>